I'm going to talk about the best tiny large language models. I'll walk you through a performance comparison of some of the top models out there. I'll talk you through how to fine tune these models, how to inference them. And in particular, I'll pay attention to using function calling versions of these tiny models. Let's get started with an overview of the best tiny LLMs. I'm going to take you through the motivation for using these small LLMs. I'm comparing the performance of Phi2, DeepSeq Coder 1.3 billion parameters, and Tiny Llama. I'll then move on to give you a very key tip for fine tuning these tiny LLMs. Next, I'll move to function calling with tiny LLMs. I want to show you the performance of OpenChat with different quantizations, making it a really small OpenChat model and show you how quantization affects the performance for function calling. Then I'll talk you through some of the challenges of getting a tiny model to work for function calling before showing you a custom model that I've developed. I've called it uh, Trellis Tiny. It's a 1.3 billion model based on DeepSeq that has been chat fine-tuned and then function calling fine-tuned. And I'm going to show you how even with this really small model, we're able to call APIs and get uh, predictable JSON objects back in response. There are two reasons why you might want a tiny large language model, which I should probably just start calling a tiny language model although they're not that tiny all the same at 1.3 or even 2.7 billion parameters like Phi2. First off, these models give you the best chance to run locally on your laptop. Potentially, you can even use a quantized model that will go below one gigabyte in size, and this makes it much easier to fit into the RAM on consumer hardware. Second of all, if you want a very high throughput API, if you want a server that's delivering over 100 tokens per second. The fact that you're delivering those tokens so fast means you can serve many more requests, and that's going to cut down your cost of serving per token. So let's get started with that com performance comparison between three different models. I'm going to use a Jupyter Notebook that's available in the Advanced Inference Repository. In fact, before I get started, let me just show you the two repositories I'll be using to guide us today. There is the Advanced Inference Repository. This contains instructions for setting up servers in a number of ways, either with Llama CPP on your local computer, on RunPod, on VastAI, or in this archive folder here, you can find instructions for setting up on an EC2 Ubuntu instance. Once you have a server running, you can then make use of these API call scripts. They allow you to run speed tests using text generation inference, using VLLM, using uh, even Llama CPP. There's also a set of scripts for function calling. These automatically handle making the calls, receiving the responses back from the functions, and then sending those responses for a synthesis um, for the language model to then interpret and give you back a meaningful answer. The function API call scripts include Llama CPP scripts, OpenAI, uh, TGI, that's text generation inference, and VLLM. Now, I'll show you those in detail a bit later in the video, or you can check out the function calling video before. I will talk a bit about fine tuning today. There are, of course, many different ways to fine tune models, uh, some of which are dealt with by specific scripts in each branch of the advanced fine tuning repo. Here, there are scripts for direct preference optimization, chat fine tuning, for developing and using embeddings, that's retrieval augmented generation, uh, function calling fine tuning, long context fine tuning, quantization of your finished models, and then supervised and unsupervised fine tuning. Now there are similarities between these scripts and what I want to explain to you today is one tweak that you need to make in the LoRa training if you want to get good performance on these tiny models. Okay, so these are the two private repositories but hopefully I'll give you enough in this video to do it by yourself if you prefer to work through step-by-step -step with freely available materials. So let's go back and start off our performance comparison. As I typically do in these videos, I head over to RunPod and I get started in the secure cloud. What I like to do is pick out an A6000. It's uh, the RTX A6000 down here. It's uh, 79 cents an hour. Click deploy and pick out a PyTorch instance that is going to allow us to run a Jupyter Notebook. So I'll continue here and deploy this. 
And once it's up and running, I'm going to upload the LLM comparison script, which is in the base of the advanced inference repository. It's this script here. So let me just come back when the instance has started and I've opened the Jupyter Notebook. In fact, it's probably already ready here. So all I need to do now is upload that LLM comparison script. And here I have uploaded that script. It is going to allow us to perform a comparison between different tiny models. Um, to start off, I'll connect my Hugging Face. Uh, I'll log into Hugging Face just so I can access any gated repos. We're actually not going to use any gated models. They're all public, so that's not essential in this case. Now, the three models I'm going to compare are Tiny Llama, Microsoft's Phi 2, and DeepSeek uh, Coder, the 1.3 billion Instruct model. Now, just to give you a little high level on each, the largest of these models is Microsoft Phi 2, which is over 2 billion parameters in size. And the smallest of these is Tiny Llama, which is 1.1 billion. DeepSeek Coder is in the middle, but it's just between the two. It's at 1.3 billion parameters. And as the name suggests for Deep Sea Coder, it is specialized for coding. And in fact, there's a system prompt that is there by default that tells the model not to respond if there are questions that are non-coding based. Um, that does restrict the field of use for which uh, Deep Sea Coder is going to be relevant. Still, it's a very strong model and coding models are very strong for function calling or when you fine tune them for function calling. So it's a relevant model for us to consider. One other thing I want to mention before we move on is that the Microsoft Phi model, this is not um, available for commercial use. It's under a research only license. And so while you can use Tiny Llama and you can use DeepSeek for commercial purposes, according to the DeepSeek license, you are not able to do that for the Microsoft Phi 2 model. And as such, that is also a significant disadvantage. Now I've set these three models and I've gone through my installations here. Um, I've installed Transformers, we're not going to use quantization because they're small models, so I'll run them in full precision so you can see the full accuracy. I'm installing flash attention as well, which will allow us to get speed ups. When I move down here to where I'm loading the three models, you'll note that for model A uh, here, which is Tiny Llama, I'm using flash attention. I'm also using flash attention here uh, when I'm loading the deep sea coder model, which is actually a Llama type architecture, I believe. But I'm not using it for Phi because flash attention is not supported. So this, again, is a little drawback for using the Phi model. So once these models are loaded, which is pretty quick because they're all quite small in size, um, we can move on and set up the tokenizers. Now, I have a little check here to see whether each tokenizer has a chat template. The chat template allows us to take a prompt and then format it with all of the prefixes and tokens required. Uh, according to what the model expects. There isn't a default template for Phi. It's actually a base model. It has not been chat fine-tuned. As such, you would expect the performance to be less, a little less good for that reason. And also because it's not fa chat fine-tuned, there's no chat template defined. So I have defined a template based on what has been suggested on the model card for Phi 2. Um, you can check that out. And if you scroll down here to the prompt, you can see that the recommendation is to format it with instruct, followed by the prompt, then a new line, and then output. And so that's the format that I've set up um, for the template. Next, I've set up a quick function that will allow us to um, stream a response. And I've then asked a simple question, which is to list the planets in our solar system. So here we have started our performance evaluation. And the first result we can see is Tiny Llama responding with a list of planets. Um, Tiny Llama here, even in the chat format, you can see it's very verbose. So it's actually getting the right answer, but it's continuing on, not just to include Pluto, but many other planets. And this seems to be a characteristic of the Tiny Llama model that we'll see a bit later as well. It just tends to be verbose and it makes it difficult uh, to have responses that are finished. Uh, which is a desirable property because we want an answer that stops when the answer is correct. Now, the Phi 2 model is excellent. It just outputs a list of planets. Even though it hasn't been uh, chat fine-tuned, it does very well here. Deep Sea Coder, as you can see, there's this uh, system message that's been injected. You are an AI programming assistant. You only answer relation quest uh, questions related to computer science. 
Um, you refuse to answer other questions, politically sensitive, etc. And indeed, it does refuse to answer listing the planets. Even though the model does know uh, the planets, it does not answer with the planets. And you might think, well, can I leave out this system prompt? And you can, but that does not necessarily mean it's going to respond. It will often still refuse to answer many questions, including questions that sometimes don't even fall within this just because it's not perfectly precise in picking out which questions it should uh, respond to or not. We'll now move to the evaluation where we're going to look at three things. The first is returning a sequence of letters in reverse. This is a very difficult challenge for language models. You'll see they do poorly. Um, this is challenging even for quite large language models. In fact, ChatGPT, uh, the 3.5, GPT 3.5 is able sometimes to, re re um, to reverse sequences of maybe six, uh, seven or eight letters in a row. Uh, GPT-4 is quite a bit stronger. It's able to reverse maybe double that or more. But many of the open source models have a lot of trouble returning sequences of letters in reverse. The next one, uh, and actually I've got the order flipped here, but we'll do your code generation test and then we'll do pass key retrieval, which is asking the model to pull a pass key that's randomly inserted right in the middle, actually, of the text and see if it can pull it out. So here I ask each of the models to return a sequence in reverse. First off, you can see Tiny Llama. We ask it to respond with this sequence in reverse, and uh, it starts talking about a poem. So this, uh, actually, it first responds by saying AC, which is not the opposite of AB. So it's simply incorrect and fails even for a sequence of two. Now, Phi, um, here you can see, um, actually, in the case of Phi, we do manage to get um, one token, two tokens in a row, that are responded to correctly. So what Phi is doing here is it takes in AB and it just responds with AB, which is incorrect. It should be BA. Next up is Deep Seek Coder. And here you do see some better performance. So it gets the first one correct. Um, I'm not penalizing, by the way, if the model blabs on after giving the right answer, I'm still considering it to give the right answer. Um, so you can see here, Deep Seek Coder actually gives the right answer and stops, which is beautiful. Now we move on to three. A sequence of three, and it also is able to get that in reverse. Moves on to a sequence of um, four, and you can see here it fails. So Deep Seek Coder, definitely stronger, likely because it's a coding model. It's seen more structured data. Um, I think that probably helps with positioning, um, getting statistically uh, the right distribution of its weights to allow for understanding of or representation of reversing sequences. Okay, so clearly based on this, the deep seek coder model is the strongest. We'll move on now and take a look at code generation. Here I asked the model to respond with some Python code that prints the first uh, n primes. I asked for the first 10 prime numbers in the Fibonacci series. So Fibonacci is 1, 1, and then you add 1 and 1 is 2, then 1 and 2 is 3, then 2 and 3 is 5, then 3 and 5 is 8. So you have this sequence that's increasing, but the numbers are not all prime. So we want the model to put out a piece of code that allows us to calculate the primes. And each of the models um, puts out a fairly large piece of code. You can see here the code that's generated. The code from Phi is quite a bit shorter, um, whereas the other two are long. Now what I've done is copied those pieces of code. I've copied the code here from Tiny Llama, and I've executed it, and it executes a series of twos. So uh, that clearly is not the correct answer. The Phi model, meanwhile, meanwhile, outputs the Fibonacci series. So it does something related, but it does not pick out the prime numbers. And then DeepSeek manages to pick out the prime numbers uh, within the Fibonacci series, the first 10 of them. And not only that, but it gets the same answer as um, what ChatGPT, uh, the GPT-4 version gets. So very strong coding performance from what's only a 1.3 billion model here. And again, the winner in this case, a coding-oriented challenge goes to the coding model, which perhaps is not a surprise, but it kind of leads me to think whether these models uh, that are not coding models would still benefit from having a lot more code. Next up is passkey retrieval. I um, upload a file, berkshire23.txt. It's a transcript of the Berkshire Hathaway 23, 2023 meeting. And I insert this passkey here, right in the middle. And with that passkey in the middle, uh, the model is then asked to retrieve. Now you could put the passkey 
anywhere else. But the hardest place is the middle. That's typically where the models perform the worst. So I've asked that question. Let's take a look at Tiny Llama. We put in this big piece of text that does indeed contain the pass key. And the response here is not even related. So uh, Tiny Llama fails on this test. Next is Microsoft Phi. And we ask it to find the pass key. And Microsoft Phi uh, manages to find the pass key within this uh, 200K length of context. And next up is Deep Sea Coder. We ask it to find the pass key. And you see, unfortunately, we get this response here that uh, it's not permitted to get it. So what is pretty unfortunate about the DeepSeq model is that at least the instruct model, it really restricts the answers you get. And so while it's got this great performance, um, you can't really use the instruct model for a lot of things, which is why later in the video, when I show you the Trellis Tiny model based on DeepSeq, I start with the DeepSeq base, not the instruct. And then I chat fine tune that model so that it doesn't block um, generating answers. And then I fine tune it for function calling. And that's the way that you are able to um, get the performance aspects that are good of the model without accidentally blocking out answers you might want. Next up, I'm going to talk about fine tuning these tiny LLMs. And really not a whole lot changes if you're running any of the scripts here um, that are in the branches for different fine tunings. And by the way, there's a video for each of these branches. So even if you don't have the repository, you'll be able to get a lot of what you need just by watching the videos on the YouTube channel. And most of what's there is not going to change at all. There's just one change that I want to talk about, and that's around using LoRa. So let me give a high level overview of how um, LoRa works just to recap, and then I'll explain what it is we should do differently for the tiny models. And then I'll show you an example actually with function calling of where this little tweak makes a difference in terms of performance. So let's go over to the PowerPoint slides, or rather my Google slides, and take a look at um, fine tuning with LoRa. To understand how you need to tweak the training for tiny models, you need to understand a bit about LoRa. LoRa is low rank adaptation, and it's a technique that is used for fine tuning these models. Large language models consist of a bunch of matrices and the matrices are bigger in bigger language models. So let's just think of some reference language model, consider it maybe a medium sized. And let's say the matrices are about 1000 by 1000 in size. Rather than training each of these large matrices, what we do instead is we typically freeze the values that are in these matrices and we instead train adapters. And these adapters are a lot smaller in size. Typically, they have one dimension that's the same, so 1024 in this case, but then the other dimension we make a lot smaller. This is called the rank, and it's a value of eight in a lot of cases when you're doing LoRa fine tuning. And there are two of these, these matrices, A and B, so that when you multiply them together in a certain way, you're able to get back to a matrix that's about 1000 in size. However, when it comes to training, you've got far fewer parameters because each of these smaller rank matrices has got 1,024 times 8, so about 8,000 parameters. So that would be 2 times 8,000 in matrices A versus B, whereas the original matrix, which is frozen, has got 1,000 times 1,000, which is about a million parameters. So this allows us to reduce in size significantly the number of parameters that we are going to train because we do this adaptation for every single matrix, or at least a subset of the matrices within the large language model. And just to further repeat that to clarify how it works, we freeze the model's main weights, so they stay there. And in parallel, we train this adapter with fewer parameters. And when we're done, what we do is we collapse. So we add the adapter on top of the original to get what we call a merged model. This technique is called LoRa, and it's shown to work well, not just from an efficiency standpoint, but from a parameter, um, but from a performance standpoint as well. And this is because the large matrices in language models tend to be sparse. In other words, they can be represented by lower rank representations, i.e. the adapter that we're striving to get. Okay, so that's a lot about LoRa, but how does this affect how we should tune a tiny model? Well, in a very large model, 
let's say one for reference with a thousand by a thousand in the main matrix. Even when we pick a small rank here, say eight, which gives us gives us about 8,000 times two, about 16,000 trainable parameters. 16,000 is still quite a lot of parameters for um, fine tuning this matrix. But think now if we go to a tiny model and remember that as we go to tiny models, we're going to have smaller matrices in each of the layers. So let's consider a little smaller model here with 256 by 256. So the base model has got smaller matrices. But what that means is when we're training the adapters here, the base dimension that we're going to start with for the adapter will be 256 by 8. So now we're going to have fewer parameters within our adapter. And the problem is already if you have a tiny model, it doesn't have that many parameters. And so the adapters can get really, really small. And that means you're just not training that many parameters, which means you can't really build much new information into the model. And so what I found, at least empirically, and this is the theory that I'm using to try and explain what I think I'm seeing, what I found empirically is that if I continue and use a small rank, which results in a very small number of parameters in my adapters, I'm not able to get the model to adapt to the data I'm using to train. And I can get it to do one very specific thing, for example, call a function, but the model then calls functions no matter what I tell it, even if I ask it what's one plus one, it won't respond to, it will just respond with a function call for the weather or whatever functions I have built in. And so the key takeaway here I'm trying to explain is when you're training a very tiny model, you don't necessarily want to use the same rank for your lower adapters because it will result in training too few parameters. Let's now see how that works in practice with a function calling example. So here what I'm going to do is train uh, the deep seek model, which is the strongest model that we showed. And I'm going to do it using uh, an advanced fine tuning script from the function calling branch. It's this uh, fine tuning function calling v3 script. And it's going to make use of um, a data set here, which is trellis uh, v3 function calling uh, that is available for purchase on Hugging Face. Now, Let's take a look uh, again via RunPod. So again, I've started up an instance and run PyTorch. And next, what I'm going to do is just upload that script. Okay, I've uploaded the script and here we have it shown. I'm not going to go too slowly through this because you can look at the function calling video that I made quite recently. But I will show you where the LoRa parameters are set and where I have bumped up the parameters uh, of LoRa. So as per usual, I connect to Hugging Face login so I can push and pull from private repos. Um, I've now connected weights and biases for tracking the model training. I've loaded a base model here. Um, this is a chat model that I have uh, fine-tuned myself from the base DeepSeek. That's kind of a side note for the purpose of what I'm showing now. I've installed the packages required. I've loaded the model. I'm not loading quantized. I'm doing full fine-tuning with flash attention. I've loaded the tokenizer. I've set the padding tokens as I discuss in more detail in the function calling video. And um, moving on here, I'm going to load my data set. Um, but first, I'm going to set up LoRa. So LoRa is this uh, low rank adaptation. And you can see here a list of the modules. So a language model has got multiple layers. And in each layer, there are multiple matrices that serve different purposes. There are the attention. Uh, matrices and there are the linear layer matrices and it's common to train the attention matrices and sometimes also the linear layer matrices as well and that's what I do in this example. They account for the majority of the parameters within any language model that's the attention and the linear layers. The norms and the other layers are important if you're doing a chat fine tuning um, but they account for a smaller number of parameters and they're not very important to fine tune if you are doing um, function calling or structured responses fine tuning. Okay, so moving on here to the LoRa specification, there are a few things we have to do with LoRa. So as a reminder, LoRa specification is basically deciding how we're going to set up these adapters. So the first thing we have to do is we have to say, okay, within each layer, what are we going to train? So which matrices within each layer are we going to apply this uh, style of an adapter to? And as I just mentioned, we're going to apply the adapters to the attention layers, um, sorry, to the attention modules within each layer. 
and we'll apply them to the linear layers, um, the linear modules, linear layer modules within each layer as well. Okay, so we have that set, and up here we have two very important parameters for LoRa, which is the rank, which I've shown here as eight, and also the alpha, which I'll explain in a moment. But first off, note that often, and as you'll have seen in many of my tutorials, I recommend a rank of about eight. Um, and that value works well for fine tuning for function calling all the way up to 70 billion parameter models. But in this case, because setting that to eight is going to result in training quite few parameters, I've increased it to 128. So that's a significant increase. I'm basically increasing the number of trainable parameters so that we can better mold um, the training of the model around the specific data I'm going to use. Now, the second parameter that I'm going to choose is the LoRa alpha. So I've already explained how we need to pick a higher value of OR, um, but we also need to adjust alpha. Now, here's what alpha does. Any language model, when you're training it, is going to have a training rate. It basically tells you, based on the data, there's some correction that the model needs to make. How far in the direction of that correction do we want to go? How far of a step? So if the learning rate is high, you take a big step in that direction, and you might get a fairly volatile but quick training. Um, or if you take a smaller learning rate, you take a smaller step, which can lead to a smoother training and a more stable training. Actually, I can just skip down here very quickly and show you within the trainer. If we go down to the trainer, you'll see that there's a place where we specify the training rate. Uh, so the learning rate here, it's set to 1e minus 4. So this is the learning rate if we were doing a traditional training. And in traditional training, we would simply be training the main matrices. But we're not training the main matrices because we're using the LoRa technique. I did, in fact, try training the main matrices but this ends up, to be, ends up being less stable and results in worse performance, actually, at least in the parameters I checked, than training the lower adapters. So we're not going to train the main matrices, so that main learning rate is not going to be relevant. What's relevant is the learning rate that we're going to use for updating these parameters, the parameters within the adapters. And the learning rate for those parameters is related to the learning rate for the model um, by the following formula. So here's the formula. The learning rate for the adapters is actually the learning rate for the model, which is the 1 e minus 4, multiplied by LoRa alpha, so multiplied by the alpha, and divided by the rank. So what this means is when you set a given rank, let's say we pick 8, if we pick an alpha of 8, that means the learning rate applied, used for the adapter will be the same as the learning rate used uh, for the model if we were doing a full fine tuning. Now, typically, it's common for language models to set the alpha to be about four times what the rank is. That means you're training the adapter at a bit of a faster rate than what you might train the base model. And that's why when I recommend a rank of eight, I often recommend uh, an alpha value of 32. So that's 32 divided by eight is four. So it would be effectively a 4e minus four rate of training. You can think about it like this in high, high level terms. So because we've decided to increase the rank, so let's go back to our LoRa adapter settings. Because I've set the rank to 128, I want to increase my value of alpha as well. Because if I don't increase alpha, then I'm going to have a very low effective training rate for the adapters. Now, I could keep it so that the alpha is a factor of four. That probably would work fine. I decided just to put my alpha as 128. So this sets the learning rate um, for the adapters, you can think of it like 1e minus 4. So that's how we set the OR and how we set the alpha. Now, after I've loaded my data set, and again, you can go look at the function calling video for how that's all configured. And once I have set up the training, I train for one epoch on this function calling data set, which is a data set with 66, 66 rows. Once I have done that, um, we can move down and have a look at some of the answers here. And I'm gonna show you the, the responses that I get from a test data set. So this is uh, not the training set, it's the answers from a test set. And I will talk you through what the answers were when I had a lower value of the rank that was insufficient. So here we have, um, we have an input to the model, telling the model that it has access to the following functions, one to get stock price and one to get 
um, the list of names of the largest end stocks by market cap. So it has two functions in the metadata, and then it's being asked to get the five largest stocks by market cap. And the response it generates um, here, this is before fine tuning, is this kind of obnoxious JSON object, which is not exactly in the format that we would expect. So these are the examples, and there are many more examples here, actually seven, just showing without the fine tuning, you don't get a properly structured JSON object um, that is going to be giving you information the way you need. Now here, just for comparison, this is what response I wanted. So if I'd have trained the model and it performed as I wished, this is the correct assistance response. But now if I go down after training, so I have to go all the way past the training, and you can see here um, during training, we've got low training loss and the validation losses maybe slightly going down. When we run the example after that training, you can see here, I've got the same question that I posed, the same test question, get the name of the five largest stocks by market cap. And here we get proper syntax. So we get a proper function call that matches similarly to the correct assistant response. Now it does add in this uh, parameter world here. That's actually an optional parameter that's specified in the metadata. So that's kind of reasonable. Here's another test question where we ask to give the names of the five largest stocks. And here you can see it's now generating the exact response we want. Now this is trained with a rank of 128, but I got the exact same thing with a rank of eight. So actually you can get function calling performance with a low rank, but the problem is as follows. Let's now go to a test question where I just ask it something trivial. For example, let's go to a test question where I just say greetings. So I give the function metadata, but I don't ask any questions requiring that data. I just simply say greetings. In this case, if you train with a low rank, you will still get a function call. So the model will just not be able to not do a function call because you've trained so few parameters, it's not able to fit around different scenarios. However, when I increase the rank to 128, I get a sensible response here, which is, hello, how can I help you today? And the correct response here is just saying greetings to you too. So this is the difference between using a low rank or low number of training parameters versus using a high number. And one last tip I'm going to give you is that you can always look at how many parameters are being trained. So here you can see the trainable parameters are about 8%. And I'm training, um, it looks like 119 million parameters, which is 8% of the model size, which uh, there are about one and a half million parameters here because we have the base parameters of 1.3 billion, plus we also have now the additional adapter parameters I've added on. So if you set the rank to eight, what you'll find is you get a very uh, small percentage, but more concerningly, you just get a very small number of trainable parameters. And that's why I say as a tip, if you're training a model, just take a look at the total number of trainable parameters. And if that's getting really small, then you may get to a point where you're not going to be able to get enough detail with your fine tuning. If you're dealing with a very large model, it's not so much of a concern, even if you're only training sometimes 0.1% of the parameters on a 70 billion model, that's still a lot of parameters being trained for the data set that you're using, which is ultimately small. So that's not going to be an issue, but for tiny models, it is. And that's the key takeaway, no matter what kind of training you're going to do within uh, supervised, unsupervised or not, just make sure you're training enough parameters if you're using a tiny model. Next up for agenda, I want to talk about function calling tiny LLMs. There are two broad approaches that I want to describe. If you want to have a tiny LLM, you can start with, say, a moderate sized 7B LLM and see how far you can quantize it, quantize it as small as possible and see if that still gives you performance. So that's one approach that I want to talk about, and I'll show you how that works or doesn't work. The next approach is to start with a tiny model, maybe tiny llama, deep seek, because that is looking good from our comparisons, or perhaps um, take a look at the phi model and fine tune that. So I'll show you some performance examples when we try and fine tune a deep seek model and the model, uh, the custom model that I'll take you through, I'm calling trellis tiny which is a deep seek fine tune for chat and for function calling. And I'll show you how to get the performance out of that with a few tips that can manage edge cases on the tiny models. 
Now, a common question I get in general, setting aside tiny models, is which model should I use if I'm going to do function calling? And there's an answer for a medium-sized or small to medium, and there's an answer for a large. And the answer is, if you want something around 7B, the best model, in my experience, is the open chat model. Open chat is a fine tune of Mistral, and it performs very well with function calling. It's even able to chain function calls. In other words, if I ask it for the weather, um, if I ask it for what clothes to wear in Dublin, and there's a function for what clothes to wear given weather, and there's a function for weather in Dublin, it knows to first get the weather and then figure out what cl clothes you should wear. That's something you don't see across most other models of that size. Indeed, many bigger models are not able to do function calling chaining. Now, for the largest models, what I recommend is always a coding model. Something like DeepSeq, the coder model, the 34B, or CodeLama will perform very well on function calling, DeepSeq being a little bit stronger. Of course, they are coding models, so they are kind of limited if you go outside of the coding domain and you want it to also answer general questions. If you want a more general model, the DeepSeq, I think it's a 67B model. You can find it in the Trellis function calling collection if you're interested in buying it. That DeepSeq model also performs well. It's a large model. Now, let's come back to the question of a tiny model and let's think about the approach of taking the open chat model, which is 7B, and seeing if we can quantize it. Now, when we talk about uh, quantization, we can think about GGUF, which is the quantization used by the LAMA CPP library. Here I've got a few quantized forms that are available. Um, the original 16-bit or the 16-bit GGUF is 14 gigabytes, so still quite large. Then we have the 8-bit eight, eight model, which is 7.7. .7. Then we have um, a four, two 4-bit four models here. There's a mixed, um, a mixed precision one that, has, that is about 4.4 gigabytes in size. And the smallest is um, a mixed 2-bit two, two precision type model, and that goes down as small as 3 gigabytes. Now, this open chat model performs very well when you run it in 16-bit. It performs well when you run it in 8-bit. It performs quite well in 4-bit in the mixed precision. But unfortunately, when you bring it down to the 2-bit, you start to find that it gives incorrect function calls. The JSON objects are not correctly structured. So unfortunately, if you cannot run a model that, has, um, that requires at least about 5 gigabytes of RAM, then this isn't going to be an option. Um, even if you have a Mac like I do, it's a Mac with an M1 chip, um, but it only has eight gigabytes of VRAM. I am able to run the four bit model. I'm not able to run the eight bit and the four bit, the text generation is kind of slow. So I would say you need at least 16 gigabytes of um, VRAM if you're going to try and run this model, even in quantized form to get some reasonable speed. You can run it on RunPod or you can run it on VastAI. So let me give you a very quick demonstration of performance here on the open chat model. What I'm going to use is I'm going to use the Llama um, CPP setup. There are already good instructions if you'd like just on the GitHub, the public Llama CPP project. I'll put that in the description. Um, I have additional guidance here on getting started, some warnings and expectations and depending whether you're setting up on a laptop or whether you want to run, you can also run with a one-click template on RunPod or on VastAI. Now, once you have Llama CPP up and running, which I'm just going to do now, so I'll head over to a terminal and let's just start a new window. I'm going to uh, CD into a folder where I have Llama CPP and I've already got uh, installed in this folder, I've got Llama CPP um, installed fully following the instructions. And there's a models folder within Llama CPP. So I'll just change directory, directory into the models folder. And you can see here, I've already downloaded OpenChat in the two bit format, and I've downloaded it in the four bit format as well. Um, so you can download those um, if you have access to this repo. You can, of course, download some of the open models as well. The Llama 2 function calling model is publicly available. And of course, there are many other GGUF models available from the block. So I'm going to CD now, um, just back one folder. And I have a script that's called, um, in fact, I don't remember the name of the script. It's called server.sh. 
And this is just a one line command where here you can see I'm going to be able to call a model with uh, two bits. And so let's just set up that server. So I'm just going to run server.sh. And now the server should start up. So it looks like the server's ready and we're ready to now make calls into the server. All of this, as I said, is described in the advanced server um, setup repo. So let's head over and go to VS Code where I've opened up advanced inference. I'm going to go and navigate to, um, I'll navigate to the llama function call.py, which is here. So this is the script that I'm going to run. It will allow us to run some test calls uh, using those functions to get the weather and to get recommended close based on weather. Now, I'm going to set my API as um, my local host because that's where the API is running when I've just run Llama CPP there. And I need to set the model as well because this uh, sets the correct tokenizer. We'll look at Trellis Tiny later, but for now I need to run the open chat model. So I'm just going to grab the open chat model repo slug from here and paste it in uh, right here as a model name. And with that, I can save and I should be ready now to call Llama CPP. I'm gonna start off with a very simple question here, which is what is one plus one? Let's see how this model does um, the command. And I need to CD into the function calls folder, function API calls. And I'm going to run Python llama cpp func call.py. Keep in mind, this is the two bit model. So we'll see whether we're able to get good performance or not. You can see already that the response is not that fast because I'm running on an eight uh, gigabyte VRAM M1, but it does get the answer. So one plus one is two. That's pretty good. Now, the next question is what's the weather in London? What the function, um, what the model should do is it should make use of get current weather. So it should call that function. Let's see if it does. So here we've asked what's the weather in London after inputting all this metadata. And let's see what kind of answer we get. Okay. So it's made a function call and based on that, um, it's given me a suggestion of what to wear. So let's actually trace what's happening. So it made a function call, that's good. And um, the function response came back from, um, from the model. And here it looks like, um, we're not quite getting something sensible. It's it's making up this function here about suggesting close, which is not quite right. So you can see already um, the model fails in two-bit quantization when you're asking it uh, to find the weather in London. If you go to the next level and you ask it for what clothes to wear in Dublin, which requires a chain function call, so it has to first get the weather and at uh, first gets the weather in Dublin and then has to get clothes using a second function, it's definitely not going to be able to do that. So it succeeds at a basic question that's non-function. It can call a function, but it's not able to handle the function response properly. So let's go back and take a look at our server and we'll get the server running this time for uh, a better quantization. So let's go nano server. And instead of running the Q2K model, I'm going to run the Q4K M model. So I'll just save that and I'll run the server. So the server's now running with the, with the four. Let's just give it a moment. Okay, we're ready now to inference. So again, we can just ask it the trivial question as a test. And here with the trivial question. Let's just check. It's actually causing issues with my video um, because it's being a bit slow too. Okay, so maybe quite appropriately, my laptop is not able to run the 
um, four bit open chat model when I'm also recording video. And so it just shows you that we do need to move to a different tiny model if we actually want to run on a laptop like what I have. I'll just note that you can run Lama CPP on uh, RunPod or Vast AI or some kind of service. If you want on GitHub, there's a public repository um, from Trellis. We can just take um, a quick look here. Here in the public one-click LLMs repo, you can find a variety of one-click um, one -click templates, including for Lama CPP. There's one here for Mistral 7B Instruct uh, in 8-bit, but you could run it in any quantization using the, one of the bloke's quantizations. You can also modify the template for your own purpose. But for now, let's get back and talk a bit about fine-tuning a tiny model for function calling. There are a few challenges with doing this. Obviously, the model is small, so it's not going to be as strong as a model like OpenChat or the even larger models. Specifically, if you look at models that are not coding models like Tiny Llama or like Phi, these models are weak at function calling and for being fine-tuned for function calling um, because they're not trained on a lot of code or structured responses. I tried training Phi and the results I got were not even usable. And Tiny Llama, unfortunately, the responses tend to blab on more than you would want, which makes it hard um, as a model to use. This means that DeepSeq is probably the best option if you want to fine-tune a model for function calling, and that's the model that I chose when I first chat fine-tuned and function calling fine-tuned the base DeepSeq coder model. The next problem is that chain function calling is difficult. I think, um, I mean, maybe somebody can find a way to do this, but the model needs to have a very good statistical distribution across data, and I'm not sure that at this model size, that is very easy to do. In fact, I'm sure it's not easy to do. I'm just not sure if it's even doable at all. So I think we need to lower our expectations around chain function calling. I think having a model that will call one function is definitely doable, and I'll show you that. But getting chain function calling on a 1 billion model is quite difficult. The next problem is a little bit like I showed you during the function calling example. There's a problem where with small models, if you get the model to call a function, it just keeps calling functions. Even when you give it a response, it will just continue to call another function. And this is a problem. Now, by using a larger number of trainable parameters, we can get around this, as I already showed you. And the other trick is to just make sure when you make the inference calls that you never allow the model to make more than one function call. In other words, once, you call, once the function uh, call is made by the model, you return it a response, and you then do not allow it to loop back and make another iteration. In fact, you can even go a step further, and you can prompt the model um, in a way that will encourage it to respond with text when it gets a response back from a function. And I'll show you that here. You can go to um, trellis-tiny. Uh, this is where I have uh, the tiny model. So let's actually just put it straight into the URL up here. And you'll see that I've noted when you are prompting the model, it can help once you get back the response from a function to say, based on the information available from the function call. So, uh, and then you get it to answer. Let me just show you what that looks like in code. So here, if I go to um, a text generation inference template, you can see I have a function here that will um, make, uh, get a chat response. Let's just find the very top of that function. So here's the chat completion request and it will send a series of messages. It will put them in a prompt format and get a response from the language model. And then there's a step uh, where it will extract a JSON object if there is one present. So if there is a JSON object, that's what's happening here, then it will make a function call. So it will call for the function to be executed. And when the function is executed, it will return the response to the language model and make another call to the language model. But what we can do here is we can add in an extra parameter to this function, to the execution, so that if it's a small model, we will always suppress a further call being made to the language model. And this is how you can manually force the language model to respond um, rather than just keep on calling functions. And as I said, what we can further do is whatever response was given, we can append on uh, now make use of the information in the JSON object and provide an answer to my previous question. And furthermore, we can actually um, 
prompt it by giving it the start of the response. So the start of the response must be based on information available from function calls, comma, and then it starts the response. And because I've um, forced it to start with this part of a sentence, it's not going to be easily able to respond with a JSON object. And so the model will give more reasonable responses. So let me actually show you uh, running this script here. I'll do a full example um, of the tiny, la um, the Trellis tiny model. As I said, this is a model based on DeepSeq and it's been uh, chat fine tuned and it's also been fine tuned for function calling using the Trellis function calling V3 dataset. Um, it is capable of function calling as you'll see and it's capable of high token generation seed speed whether um, that's done locally or whether it's hosted. So let me show you um, in two ways. I'll show you using a one-click template from RunPod, which uh, is available on the model card from those of you who um, purchase access. If you don't want to buy access to a model, um, I would recommend fine-tuning the um, DeepSeq coder model because that seems to be the strongest starting from the base. So let's just go to the quick server setup and find the one-click template. Um, we can run that template you can run it on, uh, I mean, it's going to fit on any GPU. In fact, if you want the lowest cost GPU, you should use Vast AI. Um, I can develop a template for that as well. I'm going to just run it on an A6000 here. And I'm going to continue and deploy. Now, once I've deployed, there's just one more tweak um, that I need to run. We can uh, go in here to the README. And the read we will give full instructions, including how to make simple curl calls. Um, but I want to take uh, my hugging face token, edit the pod, go to the environment variables, and add another uh, token here because I do need to put in my um, my hugging face access token. Here I have my token, so let me just copy um, the token here from run pod. <laughs> In the meantime, what I'm going to do is go to um, the Trellis Tiny model. And I'm going to download a copy of the GGUF file. So I'll go to the GGUF branch. I'm going to run an 8-bit here. My general rule of thumb is if you ever quantize below 8 bits, you're probably going to start to see degradation in performance. 8 bits is kind of the cutoff where I see the performance more or less being the same. Um, so let me download this model, 1.43. By the way, the 4-bit model should also work quite well. I haven't made it 2-bit because I think the quality just wouldn't be good enough. So I'm going to put this into uh, my Llama CPP folder, uh, which I'll just find here, hopefully. And I'll then put it into models within the Llama CPP folder and save it's got a nice short name, tiny.q-0. So I can head back over to my terminal here and look at this uh, quick command line and adjust this because I'm going to now be operating with a q underscore zero. And the model, I think, is simply going to be called tiny.q-8-0. Um, Let's check if that's downloaded yet. It's still downloading. And yep, indeed, that is the name of the file. So meantime, we can go back and check on our pod. I can close down the other pod that I was running for to show the training scripts. Don't forget to leave the pods running if you're not using them. And here we can see that the container is being set up uh, for TGI. And that should just take a moment to uh, to load. It'll then download the model weights. And once the model weights are downloaded, we'll be able to inference. I'm going to copy the run pod ID there. I'm going to bring it over here and set it uh, in my environment variables. Uh, I'll copy out Llama CPP. I'm going to copy in the pod that we're using for run pod. Copy out Llama CPP. Um, copy in the pod that we're using for run pod and I also need to copy in the model name like this here so here I've just copied in the pod ID and I've made sure the model name is set and I now should be ready fairly soon 
once the container is up and running. I'm still waiting on the container to get up and running and for the weights to download and still waiting for Llama CPP to download Tiny Llama. Er, still waiting for Llama, still waiting for the GGUF file to download as well. And back in RunPod here, we have got the weights downloaded and we're running with EETQ, which is 8-bit quantization, which should maintain good quality. I'm also using speculative decoding here, which you can check out more on the speculative decoding video with um, n grams of 3. So that should give us a little speed up as well. And we're just waiting for um, the shards to load. And now the model um, is ready and the API is ready. So I'll head back over. We have everything set up here. And we're now ready to make some function calls. We're going to make function calls using TGI func call. So uh, Python TGI func call.py. And when we look at that script, we'll start off just with the same basic question that we always do, which is what is one plus one? And let's see, one plus one is two. So that's good news. Now we'll check out uh, what is the current weather in London. So here we're expecting one function call. And you can see, uh, let's just look through this a bit more slowly, what's happening. So the question is posed, what is the current weather in London? It makes a function call. The response comes back from the function, along with this helper text to make use of that, and also some helper text to make sure the response starts off um, without calling another function. And indeed, it does get the current weather in London is 15 degrees C and cloudy. Now, let me show you the limit of the model. So let's try that chain uh, function calling question. And I don't expect it to get this here, but let's see what it does. Yeah, so it actually just hallucinates on the answer in this case um, and says I am in Dublin. It doesn't even make a function call. So you can see that um, for single use function calls, you can actually do that with a very, very small LLM, provided it's been fine tuned correctly. You do need to make some tweaks. You need to carefully chat fine tune, function calling fine tune, and then further, um, you need these manual uh, kind of filtration techniques that make sure um, it's a small model. It's not going to recursively keep calling functions. And by the way, um, if you have access to this advanced inference repo, this is all in the tiny models branch, as opposed to the main branch, which is where um, most of these scripts are located. And the little tweak I've made is to add in this little parameter, where if you say it's a tiny model, it will not allow the model to recursively call functions. Whereas if it's not a tiny model, um, it will recursively call functions, which is actually desirable if you want to use chain function calling. The open chat model will successfully be able to do that if it needs to call more than one function. Okay, so that's the TGI demonstration and that one-click template is available. Um, you can find it on the one-click LLM's GitHub repository that's public um, on Trellis on GitHub. Now, let me show you uh, the same this time uh, using Llama CPP. By now, our model should be downloaded. Uh, we can just list out what's in the model's directory, directory uh, if you want to take a look. And indeed, it's there, tiny.q8 underscore zero dot gguf. So we're ready to run server.sh. And this is going to get a server up and running. It's an 8-bit version of the Trellis Tiny model. And we're ready to start accepting requests. So I'll head back over to my advanced inference repo. I'm going to comment out the RunPod uh, API. I'll close down that server later. And I'm going to comment in the Llama CPP API. Um, note that there are also APIs here for vast AI, um, if that is of interest. Now, let's go back and this time use the Llama CPP function calling script. Let's start off here with our simple question of what is one plus one. Um, let's see if I have that. Uh, I do have that stored. So now I'm running off my laptop and hopefully it won't crash my video. Okay, one plus one is two, so that's good. So running well in that case. And let's try asking it what the current weather is in London with a little helper text. And you can see here uh, what is the current weather in London. Um, this is exactly the problem when you do not use um, 
when you do, do not use the helper text. It just will keep on calling functions. So notice the difference in, in that answer. Here I've got um, the tiny model flag turned off and just notice the difference from when we ran the same model on RunPod, which you know should give the exact same results. Um, when we ask that exact same question, let's scroll up here to find question. What is the weather in London? It gave the exact same function call, but because we included the helper text here and because we included the logic that stops the model from looping, it was able to correctly synthesize um, the response. So that just goes to show that even if your fine-tuned model has got some issues, sometimes it's possible just using logic in order to deal with those, um, as in this case here, where a little bit of helper text allows you to make use of these tiny models for function calling in a way that will answer both normal questions and uh, will answer also uh, function calling questions. Let me give a quick summary before I let you go. If you're looking for a small language model or a tiny language model, one of the best you can use for general conversation is the Phi 2 model, although it's not allowed to be used for commercial purposes. A very strong model is the Deep Sea Coder 1.3 billion model, although it really stops you from using it for non-coding questions through the way that it has been instruction fine-tuned for the instruct format. Now there is the base format, but to use that, you would need to fine-tune it in some way yourself. That's the motivation I had for developing Trellis Tiny, which is a model that is intended for utility purposes, especially function calling. It's able to make single function calls, not chain function calls, and it's also able to return short, normal responses. If you're going to fine tune, don't forget to take a look at the number of parameters you're training. You might need to increase the LoRa parameters so that you train enough parameters for your model to have some nuance. If you're going to do inference, these tiny models will allow you to get very high speeds and they're much more practical for running on a laptop. As you saw, running larger 7B models when quantized can run into issues with quality and also with the memory of your laptop. That's it, folks. You can find more resources in the description or on trellis.com and let me know your questions in the comments right below. Cheers.